Hello there. As usual, I'm reading a book when the video starts. And uh, if you haven't noticed, the book I'm reading usually has something to do with what I talk about. And I'm actually reviewing a book today. Uh, as you guess, I don't actually read that. I just have it open. I'm not actually reading the book when the video starts. But I'm talking about this book because I just just finished this book in Nimitz by E.B. Potter. Um, I got this book when I went to Nimitz's museum down in Fredericksburg, Texas, and I was I was very fascinated. And I wanted to, to read some more, and this was considered one of the better biographies of Nimitz. I think probably considered the best biography. Uh, E.B. Potter, a United States Naval Academy historian, sat down and wrote a biography of one of the greatest naval officers in American history, uh, Chester Nimitz. He was a commander of the Pacific Fleet during World War II, so he led uh, the American naval, uh, the American Navy, excuse me, I'm doing this a little extemporaneously today, the American Navy uh, to victory over Japan. And it was done by a naval historian. So you can guess this is uh, highly laudatory. Potter knew Nimitz. He very clear in that meeting. He, he'd met and spoken with Nimitz personally. And, of course, he's a naval academy man. And so it's pretty laudatory. But I do uh, give Potter credit. He does at times criticize Nimitz's actions. He does find fault. Now, he, he jumps to his defense almost as quickly. So uh, it, it's definitely a little biased, but it's it's a pretty good read. And it's written very well. Like... A lot of times you get a biography like this, it'll be written in a very uh, stilted sort of A, B, C fashion, you know, like in order. But Potter, realizing that with this reader picking up this book, probably knew about Nimitz going in, was that he commanded the Pacific Fleet in World War II. So that's the very first thing in the book, is Nimitz going to Pearl Harbor right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, uh, 1941. And then he jumps back to his youth, and he jumps back to an event, you know, right after he came to Pearl Harbor, and it doesn't start in the chronological order until you're about a third into the book and that's all about World War II which is what most people picking up this book to read would really want to read about and the vast majority of this book's about World War II since that's sort of the highlight of Nimitz's life and his career and uh, this is a good book I really enjoyed this book uh, you know it's got its flaws like every biography every historical work you'll ever pick up and it's got its biases I mean anytime you pick up a historical work Look at who the author is, know where that author is coming from, know how they're writing the work. And, you know, I was aware of that because I, I, I looked it up. I looked up who E.B. Potter was. I looked up, you know, where he's from. And so I expected this to be laudatory of Nimitz. Now, that being said, I think I admire Nimitz as well. I feel like I admire him, not from just book, the book, but from other things I've heard. World War II, there was a lot of commanders with a lot of flash and flair and, you know, very big personalities. You had people like Bull Halsey and uh, Douglas MacArthur and other commanders in the area. You know, if you read the, the book, I, I you just name me names, but I don't know if you know any of them. So the point is that, that Nimitz was sort of a very calming factor. Much as Eisenhower in Europe, you know, had to, had to worry about Patton and Montgomery, you know, here's Nimitz in the Pacific worrying about these same sort of personalities and sort of running interference and balance with them, though he, he had to compete with MacArthur for, for credit for the war and actually how to prosecute the war. They had very different ideas, and Admiral King, who was uh, commander of the Navy at the time, you know, in Washington, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, sided with Nimitz, and Nimitz's plan was actually the one used to win the war, much more so than MacArthur's. So Nimitz uh, is very much the architect of victory over Japan for the Americans. And... I admired the fact that he stepped up, did a very difficult job, and did it very well, and did it with this sort of grace. Nimitz is, uh, by accounts in this book, and I'm going to take these accounts for what they are, you know, I'm going to take them as a fairly factual account of the man, and say that he is the kind of relaxed person they made him appear to be. You know, he, he did follow Navy command, of course, he's an officer, he's an admiral, he's got uh, four or five stars through his career, five stars at the end. So... He does take the, the protocol very seriously, but at the same time, he doesn't overreact to things. He doesn't get overly angry. He doesn't get overly uh, down. He, he sort of plays level, which I think is a very important character in a position like this. He wasn't some pretty prima donna. I think a lot of people don't know Chester Nimitz's name, despite the fact that he was possibly more important than Douglas MacArthur, despite, and Douglas MacArthur, I think, is much more well-known, despite, you know, easily being on equal footing, if, as I said, possibly not more important. And... That brings me to a little extemporaneous point I want to make about myself, because, you know, egotism on my part. Um, but I'm very cautious of being overly laudatory of military figures in American or any history. 
because I don't like to encourage war. I think we should study war in history to avoid war in the future. War is something that comes and is unpleasant and people get killed and there's no such thing. As Studs Terkel put it, Studs Terkel, when he wrote the book The Good War, right in the preface he says, there's no such thing as a good war and I firmly believe that. So we should study war and the history of those things to see what we can do in the future to avoid these things. And so I'm cautious when I laud a commander, a, a military man, because a military man often is a product of war and Nimitz is a product of war, but I don't think Nimitz courted World War II. I don't think he was a fan when it came. I don't think he really wanted to see all the boys die. It, it hurt him a lot when they lost a lot of soldiers. He was definitely someone who took it very seriously and did not look for some sort of self-praise through the loss of others' lives. And that is something that encourages me and makes me think this is someone to look up to. Uh, I have my issues with MacArthur and I almost want to start bashing on MacArthur because he's the, such the polar opposite of Nimitz and that would be the, the perfect example. But I don't really want to, maybe I'll rag on MacArthur in a different video because I have a lot of problems with him and, 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 and some of the things and praising him I find problematic because of some of the things he did and said and, and, and the ways he acted. So the, the point being that Caution, right? Like that, praise a military man with sort of faint praise and caution because you don't want to encourage a warlike attitude. You know, I mean, uh, the United States, uh, we put our civilian commanders ahead of our military commanders for a reason because we should always elect the people who are actually in charge of us is the theory behind that. I know there's some arguments to be made about how much the people actually control the president, but that is the, the conceptual ideal behind it, and I like that ideal. I really do. And so I, I hesitate to praise a military man uh, if he, I feel like he's a warmonger. But Nimitz is not. Nimitz was not a warmonger. And so I really like Chester Nimitz. I feel like this is a person who, uh, in war and before war and after war, did things to make life better than the Navy. He did things to have the Navy ready. He did things, to, the, the necessary things to make the Navy what it was and what it is. And he was a good guy overall. Uh, Chester Nimitz... I think he was a good family man. He worked hard uh, to keep his uh, family together through all of these. I mean, he spends a lot of time away from naturally during World War II, but he does the things he has to do throughout his naval career to keep that family together, to keep his whole life together. He's a very balanced sort of person, and I really admire that about Chester Nimitz. You know, the military officers I admire through history are, are the ones who I think that uh, you know recognized military items of both peace and war and, and saw. The necessity for peace and, and you know Nimitz worked for the for the United Nations and worked very hard uh, to solve the Pakistani India Kashmir crisis after World War two he didn't necessarily do it because that was it was God, such a mess that he didn't necessarily he I don't know if anybody could have solved it but he didn't but he was definitely trying so he understand stood the need for peace as well as war so I, I, feel, I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm knocking the military, or especially after my Veterans Day video last week, because I definitely don't want to do that. I don't feel like I, I want to knock the military. My only goal here is to, to sort of tell you that I personally exercise caution uh, in my praise of military leaders from the past and, and the present and the future, whatever. Because, you know, if there are people who are pushing for wars that we just don't need, if there are people who push for combat and push young men into battle in situations where they could be killed when it's just not necessary, that, that rubs me the wrong way. And Chester Nimitz is not that kind of person. This is, uh, and you know, so in, in ways of book review, and so I will quickly, you know, after my little long extemporaneous rant there on, on what I think about military leaders, and hope that gives you some context about what I'm saying, uh, this book is excellent. Read this book, as I've said, it's well written, uh, tells the story of a very interesting person. You know, Nimitz comes from a poor place in Texas. He's just another German citizen in Fredericksburg, you know, the German-American citizens. He's not actually German, it's just German-American. It's the, it's the roots he comes from. And he builds his way up, he gets his way into the Naval Academy in Annapolis. He actually initially wanted to go to West Point, but couldn't get in, so he goes to Annapolis and becomes, you know, possibly the most important naval commander in American history. Yeah, I mean, there's arguments from other wars and other times, but, you know, it, you know, this was a time when naval battles were very, very difficult, very, very serious, and you know, he helped the Americans win that war in the Pacific, especially when they weren't the priority in the first few years of the war. You know, up till 43, he's really kind of fighting from a position of weakness because uh, the Americans are concentrating on Europe. But he manages to, the, you know, put together a strategy with the other commanders, with, you know, King and Spruance and 
Halsey and a lot of honestly really good military thinkers and put together a strategy that keeps the Japanese sort of off their back until they can sort of get the supplies and the adequate support they need to really make start making their push in 1943 up to the end of the war in 1945. And I, one interesting thing, really one interesting aspect of this book is when we get to the atomic bomb and how Nimitz felt about it and uh, he wasn't really, according to Potter, now okay, I'm everything according to Potter, uh, he wasn't really for it before it was dropped. He was he was a little he he was told how big it would be. He's like that doesn't seem like a he didn't really like uh, Lemay's firebombing of Tokyo earlier. He thought that was unnecessary from a military standpoint, and this this rubbed him the wrong way too. And then after in the aftermath of the dropping of the nuclear bomb, uh, Nimitz became fairly anti-nuclear weapons. I mean he he supported the the use of carriers that can carry the planes that use nuclear weapons. But at the same time, he really didn't want to use them, and he made that very clear every time he, he testified to the Senate and Congress and things that he was not a fan of nuclear weapons and nuclear warfare. That he thought that was a unnecessary uh, risk to civilian life. So, uh, in way of wrapping this up, um, so as I said, I always I'm always very cautious when I when I look back at military leaders and see what kind of people they really are. You know, winning a battle here there doesn't necessarily make a, a great man to me. But, you know, I, and one who warmongers, definitely, I'm very cautious of. But here's a man, Chester Nimitz, definitely wasn't a warmonger, definitely uh, didn't court destruction and chaos, and, and did the best he could under the circumstances, and was a solid military leader, was a solid military man, and, you know, you give him credit for doing what he had to do to win World War II. And this is an excellent book by E.B. Potter. I, like I said, take it with a grain of salt you have to. Always, always when reading historical work, you know, take it with that grain of salt because you've got to know where it's coming from or else you, you just pick up on the bias and run with it. Uh, you know, uh, you probably will anyway. It's just it's just human nature. But uh, there's my little talk. I plugged the book that I enjoyed. Uh, I hope that gives a little clarity on how I feel about uh, military history and military historians. You know, we study it to avoid war, uh, not necessarily to get into wars. That's my thoughts on it. And I hope that gives you just a little historical perspective.